Okay guys, so welcome to uh, the uh, DVM admissions debrief. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk about uh, the cycle in terms of the undergrad cohort. So people who are Canadian, Ontario residents who are applying uh, using their bachelor degree marks and that's it. Um, and we're, I mean, I, don't, I can answer questions about the other cohorts, but we're going to focus just on the undergrad cohort tonight. Um, and uh, we'll talk a bit about how the cycle works, and uh, we'll look at the stats from this year, and then I'll uh, answer questions. So I did put my phone number up on the board here. So I mainly put it up there for people who have questions who are watching on the live stream since they can't be here. But if you would like, you can also text me questions mm -hmm. and I'll answer them if I, ha I won't talk about them uh, in, in, the, in the course of my talk. Uh, so be patient, I'll probably answer your question um, if I don't answer it right away, okay? So um, the goal of the admission cycle for the veterinary college is to choose candidates that are gonna be su successful in the program and also be good veterinarians. So that's why academics is so important because the main reason why we look at academics is because the best indicator of future success academically is past success, right? So that's why um, your marks are so important. Um, and that's the website for uh, the admissions. Um, what I'll do after is I'll go to that website and show you uh, all the links so that you can take a look. So this is the selection process. Uh, each year in each class, we have 120 students. 105 of them are Canadians and 15 of them are non-Canadians. So um, if you're a dual citizen, uh, let's say you're dual Canadian and American and you live in the US, you would have to apply as a Canadian because you have Canadian citizenship. Um, and in the 105 seats, uh, you have 100 people apply from the bachelor degree uh, and then five people who apply from a graduate degree, which is a master's or a PhD program uh, or MPH program, whatever. Um, and uh, as a reminder, everyone who is a Canadian citizen um, has to be an Ontario resident. Um, not a surprise, all of the vet schools in Canada have a geographic territory that they service. Ours is Ontario. So if you are from another province and really want to come here, um, you can, but you just have to establish 12 months of Ontario residency before you apply, which would be before the end of December, the year before you want to get into the school. Okay, so here are the requirements, probably not a surprise for most of you, considering you're already well on your way in your um, academic career. So you need to have two years full time of a bachelor's degree. And uh, by full time, our definition is five courses per semester. It, that is not the definition of full time the, uh, by the university. We ask you to do five courses per semester and I'll show you why after when I talk about the curriculum. Um, so uh, you need to be doing five courses, which at other universities would be 15 credit hours or 15 credits. Uh, for us at University of Guelph, it's 2.5 credits, okay? It doesn't matter if you take more, but you can't take less. And it doesn't matter if it's all, if it's, um, some schools have courses that have less than say three credits, so as long as it adds up to 15 or 2.5, that's good for us, okay? So if you have a year-long course, the credits will be split evenly between the two semesters and it'll count as full-time, okay? Any questions about that one? There's a lot of rules around the courses. Uh, we can talk a bit about that, but that's the rule around full-time. Um, and then there's two biologies you have to take, cell biology, genetics, biochemistry, statistics and humanities social sciences. So one of the important things you need to do if you're not going to the University of Guelph um, is to make sure that your courses are eligible to be used as prerequisites and you can send in the course descriptions to um, ADM, DVM at uofguelph.ca uh, and get them approved for content before you take them so you can make sure that they're okay. Um, on the university, uh, on our recruitment website, there is a list of courses that you can use at the University of Guelph that are eligible to be used for uh, prerequisites. The list is not outdated. 
It does have old courses on it because sometimes people will apply a few years after they've graduated and we keep those courses on the list, okay? So just don't panic, they're all fine. Um, if you feel that you're taking a course that really should be on the list, um, then by all means send it into the web, to the email I mentioned, ADMDVM, and ask them if they've looked at that course and assessed it because we might have missed one, you know, uh, there's new courses all the time. We do a review every year, but it's possible that we missed one. And um, if you feel that it really is eligible for a, a, a one of the prerequisites, then please send it in and then we'll update the list, okay? Um, so if those of you are from another university, you can take a look at the list that's posted on the website and get an idea of what categories fit for each of the, um, the, the courses. Uh, for instance, biological science is a really big category. It includes things like physiology, anatomy, um, ecology, a lot of courses, different uh, subjects. So please take a look and you can kind of get an idea of what to look for. Um, and as I said, uh, all courses, if you want them to count as a prerequisite, it has to be completed in a full-time semester. Um, and uh, they have to be completed by the end of the fall semester if you're applying for the next year. So for instance, for those of you applying for entry next September, all of the courses you want to use have to be done by this, the end of this December. The reason for that is because we need a final mark, right, before we, for the calculation of the 50-50, which I'll tell you about. And we won't have that if you're taking the course in, this, in the winter semester. So it has to be done by the end of this semester, okay? Everyone understand that? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, so I just want to say that we know that sometimes life happens and um, you may not be able to take five courses. We've had people who have had accidents or illnesses or a death in the family um, or if you have a, if you're registered with um, the Center for Disabilities and um, you are required to take four courses for per semester, uh, then you certainly can uh, apply for an appeal to in order to have those four course semesters count as full time for our purposes. And most of the time, if you have documentation to prove that it wasn't your choice, then um, we'll let you have those courses, okay? So just be aware that there is an appeals process and um, if you can make your case as to why you took four instead of five courses per semester, then we'll look at that, okay? Um, same thing for people who are uh, working and they're, they finish their bachelor's and they still have one or two courses they have to do. You are allowed to take them part-time, but you have to prove to us that you're working full-time or have childcare full-time or another commitment that keeps you from going to school full-time. And that usually would require a letter from your employer or someone else. Yep. You had a question? I answered it? Awesome. Okay. Um, all right, so any questions about that? I know there's a lot of rules on the website. There's a rule about not repeating a, a past course. So if you did biochemistry 101, for instance, and you didn't like your, your mark, like so many people, um, you can't take it again. If you failed a course, of course you're gonna take it again, if it's especially if it's part of your program, right? But we're only talking about courses that you've passed. So if you want to get a higher grade in a prerequisite, what you'd have to do is take the next level up so you're not repeating content, okay? Make sense? Yep. Okay, so this is what we do. When you apply, um, we look at the average of your eight required courses, um, and that average has to be 75% or more. Um, and um, it doesn't mean that all of them have to be 75. It just means the average of the eight have to be 75. And then we look at your last two full-time semesters. So if, let's say, you're in fourth year and you take a semester that's part-time, we will not look at it for the average or the eight courses, but we'll go back to the last two full-time semesters. So that would be if you're applying for next year, that would be this semester right now, and your last winter semester, unless you did a full-time semester in the summer. You can take courses in the summer, but it has to be five. Same, same thing as all, all of them. Okay, so we take um, the marks, and we, and we do a calculation, 50% becomes, uh, is from the eight courses, 50% is from the two last two 
two full-time semesters. And then we put them together, together for a mark out of 100. And that will be your admissions average that we look at, OK? Um, and just to let you know, after the interview, that number becomes 65% of your ranking. So first ranking, it becomes 100%. And what we do is we rank everyone from top to bottom. And then uh, once we have that final ranking, uh, we uh, look at the top 220 uh, applications and the admissions committee assesses them. So they look at everything um, from like your, um, your experience, your letters of reference, which are very important. Uh, they look at uh, your essays or three essays on the uh, application. Um, and they look at everything in your file and uh, then they meet and decide if there's anyone um, that should not be invited for an interview. So what does that mean? It means that someone has an application that may have what we call a red flag in it. And the biggest red flag that we usually encounter is a negative reference from one of your referees. So right away, I'm going to tell you one of the most important things you have to do is when you ask for those referee assessments, remember you need two veterinarians and one other person who's not a friend, not a family member, uh, someone who supervised you in some way. Um, it could be a volunteer supervisor or someone that you worked for. But all three references, you must ask them if they're uh, willing to give you a good reference, not just a reference, a good one. And if any of them hesitate or don't see, don't, aren't sure that they can give you a really good reference or they say, oh, you know, I don't think I know you well enough, do not ask, okay? Go find someone else. Because if you have a reference, especially from a veterinarian, and the veterinarian says to you, well, I really don't feel comfortable. I don't really know you that well, and I didn't really see much of you in the clinic. Don't insist. Go to someone else. Because if you don't have three really good references, you may not even get to the interview, even if you have 100% as your average, okay? All right. So, once you're invited for the interview, um, everyone knows that the interviews are multiple mini interviews, right? Yes? Anyone did not know that? Yep. So that's been the style of interview that we do. Um, hold on just a sec. Uh, the question I have is, is there a specific way we can calculate the 50% prerequisite? Sorry and the 50% last two semesters in our own time so we can get an idea of the mark we will be submitting. Yeah, I, sure you can. Um, so you choose the marks that you put forward, right? So the eight courses, uh, if you've taken 20 biology courses, you obviously are going to choose the top two, right? The ones with the highest mark because marks are so important. So you want to put forward your best foot and that means choosing the courses that have the best marks. So what you do is you go through uh, all the courses, choose the ones you want to submit, calculate the average for that, and then half it, right? So percent, then half. Um, and then same thing for your last two full-time semesters, get the average percent of the two semesters, then half it, and then add those two together. And that's how you would calculate that, OK? All right. So. Um, Talking about the MMI, uh, so the multiple mini interview right now, the way we do it is it's eight stations um, which and 10 minutes each station. And uh, the way it works is um, eight people are at one at each station. Uh, and uh, you start off at a station, you go through the circuit. Uh, each station, except for one, has a scenario that you read. You have two minutes to read uh, and make notes about what you want to say. And then uh, after the two minutes, you have up to eight minutes to go in the room, at, sorry, to go chat with the interviewers. There's two interviewers per uh, station and talk about what you think about um, the scenario. So usually a scenario is something along the lines of you're a veterinarian or you're volunteering in a clinic and this happens, what do you think or what do you do? And really, there's no right or wrong answer for the scenarios. It's more about how well you express all of the, you know, the big picture and what you feel is important in that particular scenario. Um, and uh, so most of the scenarios right now are veterinary based, but not all of them are. Uh, some of them are just situational. Uh, some of them are interest of, you know, interesting questions that we're looking at. 
Um, okay, I just got a question. If you receive an interview, does that mean everything on your BIF form was good? Yeah, it does mean that uh, at, at that point, your background information was reviewed and um, you pass that particular flagging exercise and you go on to the, um, the um, interviews, okay? So, uh, in addition to the eight, um, in addition to, sorry, to the, to the uh, scenarios, what we have also is there's one station, what we call the BIF station. Everyone know what BIF is? It's something that we, it's a word we use all the time. Uh, BIF is short for background information form, which is what you fill in uh, when you apply to the program. So it has pretty much uh, all of your experiences, your essays, uh, that stuff. Uh, the only thing that you're not questioned on are your references. We don't look at those after the first assessment. Um, and so what happens is that the BIF station is you're told uh, uh, that you have eight minutes to um, answer some questions about your experience. So um, that's uh, one uh, way that we kind of get to know you a little better in the interview. And it's another way for us to check and make sure you actually did what you said you did in your application. So um, uh, it's really important that you make sure that you put down things that you actually did and what you learned. Um, and uh, I always suggest to people that uh, one of the important things that you need to start doing even before you get to university, start tracking all of the stuff that you do, working with animals, working with people, uh, working with uh, veterinarians, and uh, just write down stuff that you learned so that you can go back to it later when you're going to come in for your interview and you're fre it's fresh in your mind. So, Okay, so someone's asked me about the interview questions, how are they graded, um, and what are they looking for? Can't tell you that one. Um, there are certain traits that, like, traits that we're testing for. Um, most people assume that all the questions are about ethics, and they're not. Um, but it's good to have that background a little bit. Um, the Rawlings books is good pre 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 preparation for the interviews. Um, and the mock MMIs that are run by the Future Vets Club also is a good training. But you can get um, MMI training pretty much uh, at most of the universities, I think, now. I know that McMaster does it as well. So uh, lots of tools out there for you and lots of internet uh, help. In terms of how it's graded, um, so there are particular things that we're kind of looking for in your answer. It's not a right, or right, a right or wrong thing. It's about how much of the big picture you've touched on um, and how well you can express it. So uh, each um, interviewer has, and it, it's different for each station, there's a grid that they have that they fill in, and they kind of, as you talk, they check off all the points that you're covering. That's what they do. And so depending on how many points you cover, that's how high your score will be. Okay, is that kind of clear as mud? Yep, all right. Um, so this is just a reason, the reason why we switched to MMI so many years ago, and also a reason why the MMI is becoming more and more uh, the method of interviewing for vet schools and med schools. Um, uh, it has much less, um, it's much more objective, and it means that the impact of one person's opinion uh, does not uh, come into it because the grid is there. Uh, there's nothing that they can put in outside of their grid if they, if they don't like your shirt. You know, it doesn't come into the marking scheme. They can't give you a lower mark because you're wearing tigers or whatever. Um, and um, there's more interviews, viewers, so it means that instead of just two or three, you have 16 that are assessing you. Um, and uh, that means that it's, uh, the impact of one person is less, and so it's much more objective. So I just want to mention something. Um, the admissions committee is considering changing the MMIs a little bit this year. Um, so I just want to let you know, it won't impact you that much. Uh, the difference is, is that we're thinking of making it, instead of eight stations, nine. So it would be 90 minutes instead of 80. Um, the reason being that um, the, a lot of the assessors last year and the year before, and uh, going back a little bit, felt that the BIF station um, was too, um, what's the word, there wasn't enough time 
to really get to know you well enough. So they uh, decided that it would be better to spread it out over two. So we're looking at doing that. We'll decide that. Um, and if we do decide to change it, it'll be a very, it'll, we'll know probably in the next month or so, and I'll post that on the website. So it really doesn't change much for you. It just means that the interview will be a bit longer, but it'll still be, you know, the same idea. Okay, let me just see what kind of questions I have. Who are the interviewers for the MMI? So the interviewers are uh, veterinarians and veterinary students. So um, usually what we try to do is we pair uh, a veterinarian. It's, it could be a faculty member. It could be uh, an alum from OVC, a practitioner, um, a veterinarian from another country that's working in Ontario. So that would be one of the interviewers at the station. And then we, all, we always have uh, students that are currently in the program. Um, and uh, the exception is the background information form where it's always two veterinarians. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, did you say that the additional station that I think we are adding, is it going to be another scenario station? Or no, no, I said they would split the background information station um, into two. So what you would have is you would still have seven scenarios, but two background information stations. So it would just split it out so that you'd have more time to kind of really get into some of your experiences. And that was the whole idea, so, so that would be good. Hold on, let me just see. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, all right. So uh, this is a summary of how uh, the selection process works. Um, so after the interviews, um, what we do is we do this, the next calculation is where we take, remember that mix of 50-50 that was 100%, it goes down to 65, and then the interview score becomes 35%. And then what we do is we re-rank everybody and um, some, sometimes quite a few people change places. So uh, people who started off in the top 100 before the interview end up being out of the top 100 after the interview. So it's really important that you do well on the interview. Um, if your marks are high, you have a better chance of ending up in the class, but you can fail the interview. Um, and if you fail the interview, even if you're at the top of the class, uh, because your average was 100%, for instance, you will not get admission into that cycle, okay? Um, the other thing that we do is after everyone has gone through the interviews, um, we look over people's performance in the interviews, and during the interviews, the um, assessors uh, will sometimes note red flags. So a red flag is something that they found troubling about the interview. So there's a lot of reasons for that. A blatant example would be if someone comes in and says something racist, right? And so the interviewers would score them on the scenario and then make a note about what they, what they experienced. And then that would be discussed at the admissions committee. So if something, even if you did well on the interview, but you had a red flag that we considered serious enough for um, not being included in the class, then you potentially might not be offered admission um, even if you did the calculation with the 65, 35 and still ended up in the top 100. And this happens. So be mindful that um, your interview, you have to be professional. Okay, this is a professional school interview. So you as an individual should be professional. Okay. Um, and um, the final review is done. And then the top 100 from this pool are offered admission. Um, we don't have a wait list, but what we will do is if someone refuses their, um, their offer, we'll go to the 101st person and offer them admission. So sometimes it's happened that you've gotten a denial and said, sorry, and then um, about a week or two later, oh, um, would you, do you want to go in the class? So that meant that you were like the 101st person. Um, so that's, it happens rarely, but it does happen. Does the admissions committee see if you apply more than once? No. 
So there's a few things that we don't know about you when you apply. We don't look at your age. We don't look at what school you went to. We don't know where you're from. We assume, well, you're obviously a resident of Ontario. That's all we know. Um, we don't know, did I say age? We don't know your age. Uh, we don't know your background. Uh, we don't know if you've applied once or four times. You're only allowed to apply four times, by the way. Um, and then you're cut off. Um, so that's, so we don't know any of that. Each uh, individual application is seen on its own. So if you reuse the same references, that's fine. If they were fine the first time, they're fine the second time, right? But um, they have to resubmit their, their references. So the way it would work, is, do, do people know how the BIF cycle works? Yes? Okay. Does anyone not know the cycle? Come on, you can, yeah, okay, good. Even if it's one person, it's fine. So, um, so just to let you know, there's, a, there's three deadlines. They are on the website. So the first deadline is, come on, you all seem to know. Thank you, December 1st. And that is the deadline for just the application. Like I'm, you're putting your name in and saying you want to apply and you pay a fee, right? Um, so if you're from University of Guelph, you do the internal transfer form. So pretty easy. If you're from another university, you'd go back to the Ontario, Ontario University's application, app, oh my God, application um, center, UAC, thank you. Um, and um, just remember how you did it for high school, you do it again for the DVM program. Uh, and they open, I think, end of September, early no October. So if you wanted to, you could, as a non-Guelph, you could already put your name in. And then um, the BIF, the background information form is released and you have until February 1st to fill it in and submit it online, okay? So uh, my suggestion, uh, like I said, track your hours, track everything you learned because you're gonna have to summarize all that on your background information form. Um, make sure for every activity that you've done, that you have someone that can speak to your having done it. So a boss, a supervisor, uh, someone who you worked with. Uh, I know it's hard when you're gonna put something like babysitting on, but the family that you babysat for. Um, so you have to have someone to validate um, each of your experiences. Um, and it doesn't have to be a veterinarian, it just needs to be someone who knows. Okay, so um, I got a question about references. Uh, references should be from professionals, not from family, friends, or someone who just knows you. Um, you uh, so you have the two veterinary references, and there's rules around that one. So the veterinarian um, doesn't have to be in practice, doesn't have to be licensed has to be a veterinarian. Um, we prefer that you get experience in North America, at least some, because that's why you're coming to vet school in Canada, right? To learn how to do vet medicine in Canada. So um, in case you were wondering, the reason we ask you to get veterinary experience is because we want you to really be sure this career is for you, right? Um, we don't want you to go through three or four years of university and then four years of veterinary medicine and at the end go, oh, this isn't really what I wanted. That's not a win for us either. So um, the best way to know if you really love the career is to do it by job shadowing with veterinarians and try to get uh, different clinics under your belt just because different clinics do things differently and you should have a kind of a taste for different clinics. Try to get as much experience with different species just so you know if you like it or not, right? I mean, not everyone wants to work with horses, but we've had lots of people who come into the program who are like, I'm gonna do small animal, that's all I wanna do, and they start working with cows and they love it, you know? So that's the best way to really find out what you wanna do is by trying it, and that's what we want you to do too. Um, so just a bit of a talk. I mean, you're not gonna get refused if you only have small animal experience, but even within small animal, you can get a variety of experience, right? You can go to an emergency clinic. You can do um, work with someone who does avian and exotics, you know? So try to mix it up a bit and at least try to get two or three clinics under your belt just to see uh, what kind of experience it is. Okay, yeah, so I think um, in terms of getting a reference, it should be someone who knows you well, obviously, um, and it should be someone like, if you're working in a vet clinic and you didn't work 
that much with the manager, but you work much more with the vet tech, then she can be your non-vet uh, reference. That's fine. But you absolutely have to have two vets, right? And when you're volunteering with your, vet, your vets, you should tell them, I'm going to be applying to OVC. Um, and they should know that that's your end goal um, because they might treat you a little differently. Okay? There was a question? Yep. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, like two vets at the same clinic can write a co-reference and a, a, a tech and a vet can do a co-reference, but the vet has to sign it and it can count as your vet reference. Yeah, it just has to be the main person who has ownership over the reference should be the veterinarian, right? Are you allowed to submit more than three references? No. It has to be just three. That's all we'll read. Uh, I don't know if the system will even allow you to submit more than that. Uh, okay, so sorry, I was talking about the cycle and I got totally waylaid. Just give me one sec. Um, so the BIF opens at uh, when it, af after you've put in your application and your fee, and that's due February 1st. However, you can submit your background information form before that. You can do it if you're ready in December or January, right? Um, and we kind of hope that you do because what happens is that in your background information form you list the people that are going to give you references with their email address and then as soon as you submit your BIF they get sent the link to put in their reference, right? And I don't know if you noticed but vets are very busy, right? So the longer you can give them to do the reference the better for them. So if you can submit your background information form earlier in January, then your references will have longer to fill in that form, and then you can remind them a little more often because they often need that, okay? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll talk about red flags in a sec, okay? Yes, and both uh, your vet references can be from the same clinic. Yeah, it's up to you. We don't, it doesn't matter to us who that third reference is. Uh, we just want someone who knows you and can assess you, right? So has anyone looked at the uh, referee assessment form, like what they fill in? I suggest that you look at it uh, because what it is is um, um, the first thing they fill in is a form uh, that asks them a few questions, asks them if, the, if they're... Uh, a veterinarian asks them uh, how long they've known you, how they know you. Um, if they put down, I'm their uncle, then that reference is no longer acceptable. So remember, it can't be a family member, even if it's a vet. Um, and then um, we ask them to fill in a grid of about 16 personality traits or skills that they have to rank from not good to awesome, okay? And um, the things like that are interpersonal skills and uh, emotional intelligence and um, dependability, reliability, those kind of things. So very important that if the person can't fill in that grid, then I don't think they know you well enough, you know? So it's really important, like, if we see a reference with seven out of 16 I don't knows, then that's not good. Right? That's not a good reference. Um, and then in addition to, the, to that grid, they're asked to uh, write a letter. And in the letter, we ask them to put down um, any reason why they gave you a low score in a specific um, um, category. Uh, one of the questions we ask on the form is, do you think this person would make a good veterinarian, a good colleague? And that's very important, uh, a really important question um, for veterinarians to answer. And it has happened that some of the veterinarians have said no. And they say why. And that to us is a flag, a big flag, right? But flags, like I said, they don't have to be just from the references. They can be from other things. Um, uh, it can be from the essay that you wrote. If your uh, grammar is terrible and you can't write, um, that's a flag for us uh, because you have, communication is a huge part of uh, veterinary medicine, um, sometimes more than just the veterinary experience. Okay. 
there's no minimal time for a referee has to know you, but they have to know you well. And uh, how recent should veterinary volunteer experience be? Okay, so that, that's a big question. So some people start their veterinary experience even in high school, right? They do a co-op. And, then they, and that's great, and definitely you can put that on, especially if it was a great experience. Uh, but hopefully that's not your most recent experience. Um, we do want you to keep getting experience um, until you apply as much as you can. And yes, it can be overseas. Uh, yes, it can be, um, you know, uh, with uh, a variety of animals. We like that. Um, but just to qualify, there's a difference between veterinary experience and animal experience, right? So veterinary experience is when the veterinarian is with you in the room and you're learning directly from them. Uh, animal experience, you can also do animal experience in a vet clinic, cleaning the cages and stuff like that, helping with the animals. Um, working at a humane society uh, would also can be considered animal experience and not veterinary experience. If the veterinarian is there, then you can separate those hours and add that to veterinary experience, but I wouldn't put all of it as veterinary experience, right? Make sense? Yep. Um, how far back would you consider experience to be valid? Like in high school? Or yeah, sure, you can go back to high school. Um, a lot of people, like I said, it's great. A lot of people start really like, I mean, how many of you knew you wanted to be a vet when you were five? Raise your hands. Look at that. What would you see? Uh, but um, uh, putting down experience when you were five, no. Not, don't do that, uh, but definitely high school is fine, and then up through university is fine, yeah, okay? And you don't have to be paid for it. It can be volunteer. It's all the same to us. Um, just put in everything, every minute that you worked with a veterinarian, okay? Ah, good question. Okay, would a veterinarian still be able to serve as a reference if they were acquainted with a family member? Depends on the acquaintanceship, right? Um, if they're married to them, then mm, no, it's considered family. Uh, but I think that everyone knows a veterinarian, right? Like it's, uh, you know, a lot of people become friendly with their vet, you know. Yeah, I think you have to judge whether or not um, they're considered a professional reference or not. Um, you have to have worked with that vet for them to be a reference because th that's what the veterinary reference is about. It's not about someone that you socialize with that has a DVM degree. It's about working with them as a veterinarian, learning veterinarian skills and learning what the profession is about. So that's what the veterinary references are for. They're there to teach you uh, about the career to solidify for you whether or not the decision to become a veterinarian is one that's really good um, for you, uh, to clarify your expectations of the career, and to judge whether or not they feel you'd make a good colleague. So um, that does not mean someone that uh, you know from a book club or something that's a veterinarian. It means someone you work with, okay? Um, if you work at a vet clinic, how do you separate your animal and veterinary experience? Well, like I said, veterinary experience is when you're working directly with the vet. So if you're not with the vet, that's animal experience. Okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. There was someone back there that I think had a question. Did I answer it? Yeah. Um, Well, if your grades didn't meet the cutoff, um, you could do the calculation, right? We post the stats. So um, it's sometimes, uh, yeah, you could po probably figure it out. So um, if you don't get an interview, it's uh, probably, most of the time it's about marks, but it could also be about um, a red flag. And then if you get an interview, and you still got really high marks, but didn't get, a, get, get an acceptance, and you look at the stats from that year, and you know that your marks probably would have hit the top 100, then it was probably because you were flagged in some way. Would you um, know if you 
No, you don't see it. That's what I said. So um, if you remember, I said that you give us the contact information for your references, and then they're sent the link to fill in the online uh, reference, right? So that's why it's really important that, they, that you ask and make sure that they're going to submit a good reference for you before. Um, and if they hesitate, then say, it's OK, don't do it, right? Could you just close that door, please? Yeah. Just pull it. Yeah, just pull it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Come on in. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so you, you don't see the references when they get um, uh, put, in your, put in your application. Uh, it's, uh, it's private information. You won't, um, you're not supposed to see it. It's a privacy thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if that... Uh, that No, and we don't look at references from the last year. Every, every application is fresh each year. So, um, yeah, so if you use different references, if you suspect someone gave you a not great reference, then you go with someone else, then it won't, we, it won't impact the next application. Yeah, OK? Can one of your veterinary references be from outside of Canada? Oh, yeah, for sure. So good question. Uh, can vet references be from vets that are out of Canada? That's, you can. We do prefer that you do experience in Canada because that's, because like I said, the idea of getting the, the experience is to see if this is really the career for you and what you're going to be preparing for is a career in Canada, right? So you should have experience in Canada to really see if this is what you want. Okay? Anyone else? Yep. Okay, we're going to go there, but um, so the, the, the um, that's a good question. So in terms of what, what grades to aim for, um, the answer is the higher the better, right? Uh, so every year it's gone up a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the numbers in a few minutes. But um, so the 75% is a minimum. But everyone who's ever looked at the stats online can tell you you're not competitive if you're at 75. Maybe for an international school, but not for Guelph. So that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, the competition in terms of marks is pretty uh, steep. OK, so someone asked if you can use marks from a semester with 2.25 credits, unless you could do an appeal. So the minimum is 2.5, right? So five courses or in other universities, 15 credits. If you have less, it's a problem. If you have that or more, it's not. So if you do more than five, that's fine. If you really want to do that, um, it's the problem of less. Um, and we'll talk about that. So let's talk about the numbers. Um, so uh, the, you can see that uh, the marks are quite high, so about 90. Uh, for the people who got interviewed and the people that actually got admitted. Um, but there is a range. Uh, so, um, and these are the interview scores. So you can see that the range was from okay to really great. Um, and the median was about 80. Uh, so that's why we say you can use, you can choose the eight courses that you put forward, but it's really important that you choose the highest marks. We're not going to be more impressed with a mark from an animal science poor, uh, you know, like course than um, something that's less animal related. Um, as long as you have the prerequisites, you choose the ones with the highest marks. Um, and uh, we'll take the last two full-time semesters. OK? Let me just see if there's any questions. If you worked for a veterinarian full-time, would that entire time be considered vet experience or would you need to differentiate between vet and animal experience? You need to differentiate. 
because not everything you do is vet experience at a clinic, right? If you're doing reception, that's great because it's important for your people skills. Uh, and that's why we have extracurricular activities listed and work and all that in your application because we want you to have experience working with people. Because if you're going to veterinary medicine because you don't want to work with people, well, wrong. Because every animal comes with a human attached, right? You have to talk to owners, you have to, you'll work with other people in your clinic if you end up in a clinic. So you have to be able to work with people and the more you do that, that's great. So when you work in a clinic, you're obviously going to do some extracurricular stuff, work like job stuff, animal experience when you're working with the animals and vet experience when you're working with the vet. So just keep logging all of that and then at the end you can do, an, do one, um, you know, like uh, one vet clinic, you did this much vet experience and this much animal experience. So you'd have it in different categories and that's fine. Yep. Assuming most veterinary referees know you just as well, does it look better to have two different clinic veterinarians, like two different clinics on no. the No, okay. no. You it, it just get the best references. Doesn't matter what clinic they're from. I mean, if you worked at five clinics and you only have one clinic for the two references, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention is that when the, um, when the veterinarians uh, put in their references, they have to put down how many hours they've worked with you. So if you put down 6,000 and they put five, that's a problem. And that's another thing. Like I, We're willing to accept if maybe there's a typo somewhere, so we will sometimes verify with the veterinarian. But if there's a very big discrepancy with the number of hours that the veterinarian says you worked with them and how much you said they worked with them, then um, it's an issue for us. Yep? Uh, what if the, like, you listed your vet experience at that clinic and there's like three vets at the clinic and their reference is from one of them and it's less hours? But yeah, that's okay. okay. That's okay, yeah. So the question was, sorry for people online, um, was if you work at one clinic and you're working with three dif different vets, but only one of the vets is giving you a reference, or you've asked only one vet for a reference, and their hours are less than the total, that's fine. Um, and that will be explained in, your, in the BIF. So we'll see that. Because you'll put down more than one vet. Yep. Yeah, I said that. So, yeah, you can use the same references how many times you want. No, but if you haven't had time with them since, like, yeah, year, that's so fine. That. If you want to, I mean, if you, if you want to ask the person that you volunteered with in high school to write your reference, you can do that. Not a great idea, because they'd probably go, oh my God, I don't even remember. Or, yeah. Uh, so as long as they can provide a good reference that's detailed and they still remember everything, yeah, go ahead. You can use a vet that you worked with two years ago. Um, just be mindful that when you ask them for that reference, right, that they, that they commit to doing a good job for you and that they still remember everything. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, all right. All right. So this obviously is the biggest piece of your application. How can I improve my marks if I've applied and I didn't even get an interview? Um, so like I said, you have to choose your highest marks in the eight prerequisites. Um, some people, if they finish their bachelor's degree and their marks aren't where they want, they do a non-degree semester. Um, a lot of people do that. Anyone here in a non-degree semester? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's very common, um, and sometimes what will happen is um, if uh, you want to take courses uh, that replace a, a prerequisite, like a higher level, right, um, and you're working full-time and you can't go to school full-time, then you can apply for an appeal and say, uh, this is my a letter from my employer, I'm working full-time, um, I, I have to take another statistics or whatever, but I can't do it in a full-time semester and uh, ask the admissions committee to allow you to do that part-time. So that's out there for people who are working or have a family or other issues. Um, and again, if you need help, get help. Get tutoring if you need it. Um, 
Uh, I always tell the story of one of our graduates who, when they were an undergrad, uh, very super bright uh, woman, but wasn't getting the marks that she, she expected. And what ended up happening was she learned, uh, she was assessed and found out she had a learning disability that had gone undiagnosed until this point. And um, once she was assessed, she was given tools and techniques to really help her uh, deal with her issues. And uh, her marks went from 70s to 90s. So um, that's also a potential um, issue for some people. If you think that you might have a, a learning disability and, a, and you're not taking things in, then that might be something that you might want to look at. If we're only using courses from first and second year, does it matter what level those courses were? No. So you can actually submit prerequisites from any semester. If you want, you can submit a first year course as a biology. If you rocked that course and got like a 98, of course, use it. If it fits the criteria, hey, use it. Um, uh, the uh, level of courses only matters in third and fourth year. There's a rule around you have to take 60% uh, of your courses have to be third or fourth year level, and then 40% can be whatever level you want, right? Um, so yeah, your prerequisites can be any year level. In the non-degree semester, do the courses still have to follow the 60% rule of the courses needing to be third and fourth year courses, or can you take any courses? You have to, after second year, any semester you take has to apply that rule. So even in a non-degree semester, it has to have the same uh, idea. So I'll tell you why. Uh, there is a rationale behind all of our um, admission requirements. The full-time rule of five courses per semester is because of the uh, content of our VET program. Um, so first year of the VET program is about six and a quarter courses per semester. So if you can't do five, you'll have, you'll have a real struggle with six and a bit, right? Um, and the other, um, the other co uh, reasons that we ask you to do like higher level courses in third and fourth year and beyond is because we want you to be constantly challenged and not take a lot of first year courses to try to get good marks. So we really want you to push yourself because once you get here, um, it's a lot of content. So we want you to, you want, we, we want you to be ready. Uh, let's see. If you're using your second year marks for your past two semester grades, does it matter what level they are taken at? No. So first and second year, um, I mean, you're free to take whatever level. You have to obviously uh, do what your uh, program asks you to do, but you can use whatever you want. Okay. Uh, animal and veterinary experience, as you know, is really important for the vet program and not just for us, for you, uh, to gain experience and comfort level working with different animals and uh, to understand the career. And the, by the career, I don't just mean clinical medicine. There's so many other things veterinarians can do. It's an amazing career with so much opportunity. So if you, uh, through your networking, find a vet that works in government or industry or does research here at OVC, perhaps, um, that's a great way to get to know that part of the career. Because the more you know, the more you can choose wisely and decide what you want to end up being when you grow up, right? Um, okay, so that's my plug for different careers and for you to get experience. One thing you may or may not know, especially the first years, is that um, that a lot of our faculty here at OVC are veterinarians. They teach in undergrad. Some of you may have had them. And they also, um, they also hire students to do research positions over the summer. So it's a great way for you to kind of test out, if you like, um, veterinary research. Um, a lot of our faculty are great mentors, and uh, they'll guide you through a summer project and you'll present a poster at the end if you're part of the summer program. Um, and it's a great way for you to get a veterinary reference because at the end of the summer, if you've impressed that veterinarian who's faculty here, they can be one of your veterinary references. So one more thing that you can possibly do. If you work for a veterinarian full time, would that entire time be considered that experience? Oh, I already asked, answered that. If you apply from a university with a different 
grading system, how is your average determined? Okay, so I think that you're asking about letter grades. Um, so what we do is we have a conversion chart for Canadian universities, uh, and often we'll actually go to the university and see what their chart is. Um, and we do convert. Uh, so if, for instance, just an example, if you have an A+, plus, and A plus is considered um, 85 to 100, we would assign you the midpoint of that at, and that's 92.5, right? My math right? Yeah. So that's what we would do. We would assign you the mid, mid grade of a range. Some universities do have, uh, like, um, they do convert the letters, so we use their system, okay? All right. Referee assessments, we already talked about that. Uh, be sure that they're going to be really quality um, and that they can really fill in that grid that's those 16 traits and that they know you well enough to do that. Um, these are the three essays that are going to be on the application. Um, so I think this is on the website, but you can take a picture of it if you want. Um, and really, it's a way for you to um, express to us exactly the thinking you've done around the veterinary profession and some of the experience you've had, you can make it as personal as you like, but it has to be well written. So please, uh, before you submit it, put it through a word and do a grammar check, okay? Please. So we don't want that to hinder you in any way. Um, and if you want to enhance your interview skills, here are a few resources for you. Uh, a lot of universities offer tools for you to, to uh, help you get ready for interviews, like I said. Toastmasters is a really good um, club to join in terms of uh, learning how to do public speaking, not just interviews, but it's a really good skill, uh, possibly a skill I should learn. Um, and um, the Future Vets Club does uh, do the uh, mock MMIs in the winter semester, so um, if you haven't joined the club, you can do that tomorrow night. Um, and uh, you can always go on and join the Facebook group. Just type in University of Guelph Future Vets Club and you can uh, join that uh, Facebook group and uh, the dates are usually announced there as well. Okay, so some typical questions is I've applied four times, so remarks are not competitive. Um, so one of the things that uh, we do say is that not everyone, obviously, is going to get into OVC, so uh, you, you must have a plan B if your marks really aren't close to where you want them to be, um, aside from getting help and it's just not working. Uh, so there are international schools that accept Canadians. Um, they do cost more, unfortunately, um, but there are uh, schools in the U.S. and there are schools in the U.K., Australia, New Zealand that accept Canadians. And uh, normally, Canadians do very well in those schools, and uh, the entry marks uh, don't have to be quite as high. Uh, but make sure whatever school you end up going to, it is AVMA accredited, and you can find that list on the, on the website for the AVMA. AVMA is American Veterinary Medical Association. We are accredited. All the Canadian schools are accredited through them, and I think all of the American ones. Um, so that's really important, and the ones in the Caribbean, some are, um, the ones in the UK and the ones in Australia and New Zealand, and um, yeah, those are pretty much. Uh, there are the European schools and the ones in South America, I'm not sure, so that you'll have to check if you uh, are looking at those schools, but at the end of the day, if you go to an AVMA accredited school and you graduate, you're a veterinarian. Okay, and you can always come back and work here. So um, all the AVMA accredited schools, uh, what you do in your fourth year is you would write the um, NAVLI, which is the North American Veterinary Licensing Exam. You obviously don't have to worry about this, but it's the same exam for all of North America. There's not one for Canada and one for the US. It's the same one. And it basically uh, licenses you plus your education here uh, to work as a veterinarian in North America. And then uh, you'd have to write an additional exam uh, in whichever province or, on, or state that you wanted to end up in. And that is run by the licensing body for that particular province. Um, 
So you would write one for Ontario, and that exam is more related to legislation, um, how to store narcotics, um, how to uh, report abuse, you know, around the, the law of veterinary medicine in that particular province. So two exams, and then once you're done your program here, you can work, or you can decide if you want to do a specialty, and that's another ball game. Then you do an internship and residency program and become board certified if that's really what you want to do. And uh, you don't have to necessarily ever graduate. So yeah, so let me just see, how long do the essays need to be? Oh, good question. I, I think the limit is 1,000 characters, including spaces, I think. I might be wrong, so I have to check that. That's not in my memory right now. Um, would looking for an app such as dog sitting, app, rover, etc., count as experience you could use on an application? Uh, well, it could be animal experience, but you'd need to have a verifier for that, so you'd have to be willing to put forward someone that you worked for. Okay. Okay, I think that's it for the questions online. Um, any questions here? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear that at all. Characters. Characters, yeah. It's, it has to be a short, succinct essay. Okay, so um, one other thing I just wanted to mention is that there are regular tours of the vet college. Every Friday at 1230, you do have to sign up for it, and it's given by current veterinary students. Um, there's going to be some tours offered tomorrow night at the uh, Future Vets Club meeting. Um, but that's the uh, email to uh, email if you want to reach me at, or have a tour. Okay, could you use a current OVC student as a veterinary reference? They're not veterinarians, they're students. <laughs> so, no. They could be your other reference, but they would have had to know you uh, in a professional way, not just as a vet student. Um, yeah, if you're volunteering with them, they could be a reference, but they, Anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go to the website. It might take a little while because sometimes this is a bit slow. Okay, so everyone should know our website is ovc.uoguelph.ca. So that's our website. And sometimes there's some really cool events happening that you're welcome to go to. Um, wow, that's really far away. So, <laughs> but you might want to look at the bulletin. So uh, we have a weekly bulletin that has some really cool information about all the new stuff that's going on at OVC. So for those of you uh, looking for the admission requirements, you go to future uh, students, future vets, and then applying to DVM, uh, Canadian students, everyone's Canadian in the room, yes, uh, admission requirements, Academics is all the stuff I told you about. And this is the list that I talked about of courses you can use at the University of Guelph. Down here, all the rules around courses. <laughs> and then, course evaluation requests for those of you who are not from Guelph. Um, you can actually send in something before you even take the course just to see if the content is okay but you also should send in your transcript if you've taken the course to make sure it was in a suitable semester. And here's the appeals process if you want to take something in a less than full-time semester, okay? And certainly make, make use of this uh, appeals process, okay? So let's go back to OVC, and I want to show you the current DVM student pages. So the years of the uh, veterinary program are called phases, um, and that's because we don't want to confuse it with undergrad. So undergrad is first year, uh, DVM is phase one. So this is uh, first year, and these are the courses that you take in your first year. So you can click on them, and it tells you all about what you learn, what the objectives are, everything, who teaches it. So if you're curious, you can look that over. And the same up here with all the other phases. Uh, so you can see <coughs> there's quite a few courses, sorry. Um, and um, that all together, if you count up the number of hours per week, 
like every week's different. It comes to over six courses per semester. Um, and you're in class pretty much uh, in the vet program from 8.30 in the morning until about 5.30 in the afternoon, straight, with a, an hour for lunch. We give you lunch, you know. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's a lot of content, and that's what's so overwhelming about the program. It's not that it's so really hard, but there's so much to know, right? Um, so this is phase two. Um, same thing with the courses, also over six courses per semester. And then by the time, sorry, <coughs> you're in fourth year. So first year is mostly what's normal with some abnormal. Second year, the biggest course is principles of disease. It focuses a lot on, um, you know, all the bad things that can happen, parasites, diseases, all that stuff. So very big course. Um, and you start learning, anyone know what theory of genealogy is? Hey, reproduction, very good. Um, and you're starting to get a bit of clinical stuff, right? And then third year is pretty much all clinical preparation. Um, so look at all that stuff, right? And there's no link, so well. So that's what you learn. And then in your summer after third year of the VET program, you go into an eight-week externship, which is um, working at a mixed animal clinic. Um, and then you do your rotation. So you choose your stream. So... <clears throat> there are four streams that you can choose from. So uh, you don't really see much here, but what you do is in third year, decide where you want to focus in your fourth year. You can choose small animal, food animal, rural community practice, which is kind of mixed animal, um, and then uh, equine. So you can choose one of those four. And in those, you would focus most of your rotations on those species, but you have choices in terms of if you want to look more at exotics or if you want to do a bit more in dermatology or um, dentistry, you know, you can choose uh, some elective rotations to focus on things that you might be interested in. Shelter medicine, for instance, you know, lots of choice. And then in your fourth year, you write the, the licensing exam. And then at the end of fourth year, you write the uh, Ontario exam. And then you can go and work right away. If not, if you want to do an internship of a year, if you feel you're not ready and you want to get some really more intense training, you can do that. And uh, that would be, you do the application in your fourth year. Uh, they're usually due in, mm, I think it's December. Yeah, and that's run through the US. So it's for all of the North American schools. Sorry guys, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> all right. Ah, okay. So, yes, okay, good question. So, um, we allow students, uh, you have to apply um, <clears throat> in December, right? But in December, you don't know what your marks are for your fall semester. So, if you apply and you get your marks and you realize, oh, I don't think I should apply anymore, we allow you to withdraw without penalty, okay? So you can do that, um, if you do, but you have to do that before, I think, February 1st, before the BIF deadline. So that's, that, that's a question. Yeah, okay, so I just wanted to address something. Someone asked about an appeal. So once you have an appeal approved, it goes on your record, and it's for any application after that, unless it was just for that application. And you'll be told that in the letter. But normally, if you have an application and you're saying, I couldn't take five courses per semester because I was in a car accident, um, then that semester, once it's approved, will always be OK. All right? Any other questions? OK. Oh, good question. And I. I used to know the answer to this, but so that's a good question. So there are some year-long courses worth one credit, and she's asking whether or not she, you can use it as two prerequisites. I don't know. That's a, that's a Kelly question. Does anyone know that answer? You can? Thank you. Sorry. No, no memory room. So yes, you, apparently you can. Yeah. Sorry? For the like, uh, references, like, do our referees have a specific duty to be able to reference 
Yeah, yeah, of course. It has to be March 1st. That's right. So I didn't say about the last deadline, but um, references and your final transcripts are due March 1st. So that's why we can't take marks from anything in the winter semester, because by March 1st, you're not going to have a final mark, right? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I would think so, right? Like you could choose, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a, that's a Kelly Hunter question. Why don't you email ADM DVM? Okay, ask that question, CC me, okay, CC me, and um, uh, I, can, uh, I can put that up on the future vets, like the Facebook group, yeah. Okay, yep. Oh yeah, you can you can use everything the same. Yeah, you can use the same essays. You can use everything the same. If the only thing, like if you've applied twice, uh, the second time you can use everything the same as long as like if it's just your marks that have changed. Yeah, we won't look. We don't know. Yeah, unless maybe it was bad the first time. I don't know. So yeah. Yep. Yes, okay. yes. You can't defer your admission um, for something like that, like if you want to go backpacking across Europe or something. Uh, but what you can do, and we have had it happen, uh, there's been, you know, something that's like under compassionate grounds. We have, we've had people who had uh, sickness, like a mem family member fall sick, and um, they couldn't come for that year, so they deferred for the next year. It can't be by choice. So that's mainly the, the thing. So. You can defer if it's something that you couldn't avoid or it was a situation, but if it's your choice, then you have to apply again. Okay, and just so you know, if you go to an international uh, veterinary college, you cannot transfer here. We don't accept people from other schools. So um, I get that question all the time. If you end up going to say Dublin or the, or the Royal in London, um, then you, you can't come back here unless you've applied into first year and got accepted that way. Anyone else? Really? Nothing? Okay, hold on, I'll just do, anyone have any questions before? Yep. Is the um, transfer form and all of that that we needed for our undergrad students, is that all open right now to apply? Or do you, I can't remember if you said it would end in September. Oh, I don't know, I don't control that, but I, I think it opens in October. This is like the process for, for an undergrads to apply. Yeah, yeah, the internal transfer form I don't think is open yet. But I think it, does anyone know? Did anyone apply before and it opened October? No? Just keep, well, you know, keep trying. So, okay guys, so um, I just wanted to remind you that if you want a tour of the vet school, you can email me and uh, they're Fridays at 12.30. Uh, Future Vets Club uh, general meeting tomorrow night in this room. So hope to see some of you back here. Uh, okay, thanks very much.